look at this beautiful Amstrad PC 1640. It's in near mint condition and I want to show you today why it was so popular over here in Europe just like its predecessor, the Amstrad PC 1512. I bought this one from a collector in the UK who kept it in original boxes since it was purchased shortly after it was released in 1987. Back then, this bad boy had set you back about £700 for the single floppy model, including the EGA display, which I've got here. And for about another £250, you could get the model with a 20 megabyte hard drive. Speaking of £250, I bought this machine cheap because of some, quote, discoloration of the monitor plastic after all these years. Let me know in the comments below what you think. Did I get ripped off? I'll show you more of the outside of the machine a little later, but for a wave of retro computing nostalgia, let's boot the machine from the first disc that came with it, MS-DOS. And by the way, this machine came with a graphical operating system that's not Microsoft. It's called GEM. Yeah, you heard that right. Graphical operating system that's not Microsoft Windows. Now this particular machine when it boots says PC640K, that's the amount of memory installed, and the BIOS is copyright 1989, which probably gives us an indication of when this machine was built. Then it installs a RAM drive, which has a disk drive in memory, because this machine doesn't have a hard drive, and then it's going to install the Amstrad mouse. Now you might wonder how we get into GEM if we don't have a hard drive. Well, of course, you just put in disk 2, which is the GEM startup disk, and then you just type GEM. Now, I actually tried this with the version of GEM that came with the PC1512, and it actually just hung the machine. So we have to use the specialized 1640 version here, which also has the advantage of being EGA. So you'll see that beautiful high resolution display come up in just a moment. By the way, I apologize for that line that moves up the screen every now and again. Even though my camera is set at the same frequency as the monitor, it isn't exactly the same. And so there is a very small beat, which you'll see in the form of that line. Anyway, it now asks us for the GEM desktop disk, which is disk three, which we put in the drive. And now it'll boot into the GEM desktop. And look at that beautiful EGA graphics. Actually, I have never seen this myself before. These disks have never been used. GEM is a lot like Microsoft Windows, of course, with folders and icons. These weren't the invention of Microsoft, of course. And down below we have the disk drives, also the RAM disk, which I talked about, which is mostly empty at the moment. And to go back, we just hit this button in the upper left corner. But let me show you some of the apps that came with this. Doodle is a very basic app which just allows you to draw freehand lines in various colors. Uh, so you can see it's not very sophisticated and I'll show you a much more interesting drawing program a little bit later called Gem Paint. Uh, this does allow you to change the pen color but there's not much else you can actually do here. One of the apps that's quite interesting is NVR. This is for adjusting the values in the non-volatile RAM, like a BIOS setup program basically. Uh, there's options there for the initial screen colors, uh, which allows you to change the foreground and background color of the text when the machine boots, uh, the size of the RAM disk, and initial screen mode. And if you look in there, you can have CGA, monochrome, or EGA. Those were the options that were available for this machine for graphics as adapters, by the way. And there's various other things for the joystick and the communications port and so on. There's also a basic editor called RPED, and this is very primitive. Uh, we'll just create a new file here. And so we'll just call it PC Retro. And I'm sure that everyone's seen a file editor, but I just want to show you what this particular one looks like. Uh, so you can immediately get to work and start typing. It auto saved the file that we created, and here's the doodle that we drew earlier. If you click on these, nothing happens because there's no application associated with them. But let me put in a much more impressive application called Gem Paint, which is on the fourth disk. Now this is a much more sophisticated drawing program. In fact, there's even fill styles. For example, I could draw a rounded rectangle here and it immediately fills it in with that blue. And I can also draw circular objects and I can put borders on things, select the color of the border and then do a fill for those. And notice how quick it is for an 8086 CPU, although it is actually approximating this with a polygon here for speed. Still, not bad for the day, and there's also a flood fill option here, which will actually allow you to do patent flood fill. So you can imagine using this program for drawing banners and doing all sorts of artwork. It's not the most sophisticated or even the fastest program of the day, but not bad for something that actually came with the operating system that you had installed on your computer. 
This is an 8 MHz 8086 machine, by the way, and you can just about see the CPU poking through in the back here after I move the cover. There's also a slot here for an 8087 coprocessor, and a popular upgrade was also to put an NEC V30 in, which was plug-in compatible with the 8086 and sped the machine up pretty significantly. There's also three ISA slots here. They're just 8-bit ISA slots, and there's another one hidden away in under here. That one was for a hard drive, if you had the hard drive in the front of the machine, but you could also stick a hard card in the back and a VGA card, which would give you more graphics options. Removing the cover doesn't show much else. The main board is covered with this metal shield, which is presumably for radio frequency interference, just like the fairly sturdy containers that the floppy drives are in. I've removed one of the floppy drive cables here, so you can see this chip down here. It says Amstrad 40526, and presumably that was either one of the BIOS chips, or it may have been part of the EGA implementation, which is actually on board. And the CPU in this one seems to be an AMD 8086-2. While we've got access to the back, let's take a look at the connectors. There's the power input, which comes from the monitor. It's a little bit unusual in that the power supply is not in the main machine, but in the monitor assembly. There's also the EGA port, and there's a bunch of dip switches for selecting the display type, including the option of supplying your own graphics adapter, for example, a VGA card in the expansion bay. There's a parallel printer port and a serial interface, and that's about it. Uh, this particular machine was made in Korea, and that's the serial number, and it also gives a little bit of information about the power rating of the expansion slots. The remaining connectors are around the side. This is for the mouse, and of course there's a keyboard connector, which is proprietary for Amstrad. There's a volume control for the PC speaker, and the joystick connector is actually on the keyboard itself. Now one of my favourite games to check out with EGA is Grand Prix Circuit. It comes in a CGA and an EGA version, and you might think that this is the first time that an Amstrad user would get to see 16 colour games. But even with CGA, the Amstrad PC-1512 had a special Amstrad 16 colour mode. The only problem was, it wasn't available in many games, and it wasn't until this standard EGA implementation in the 1640 that a lot of games would function with 16 colours. Now you can see the performance here is a little bit better than the IBM PC, but not much. But bear in mind that there's twice as much going on here. After all, this is 16 colours, not four, so you have twice as much data to put into video memory. Anyway, let's check out some of the other games that I got at the same time that I purchased this machine. Now the first of these is this 3D chess game. Now this is not Battle Chess. It's just moving the pieces about in 3D without any action sequences or anything like that. And it takes quite a long time to compute a move, even in the open book here, which suggests that it isn't a very powerful chess engine at all. Uh, but still a pretty nice looking one, given that the other option would have been a text-based interface. Now I mentioned that the graphics performance of this machine is really quite good. And we can see that in top bench. If I just add this system, the PC1640 is not in there at the moment, then I get a CPU speed, a memory speed, and also a video memory speed. So if I just make this Amstrad PC1640, then I should be able to compare it with other systems in the database to see how it performs. And now I can compare it against the Amstrad PC1512, which is already in the top bench database. You can see that the opcode speed is basically the same, the memory speed is basically the same, but the video memory speed is a massive improvement. The time goes down from 2961 microseconds in the case of the 1512 down to 1980 microseconds, so 1.5 times faster. And that's really why this adapter is so much better than what was in the previous model. Well, I've lucked out a little bit with the games that came with the machine. I've got Defender of the Crown. It does say color graphics adapter required, which would be CGA, uh, but it also says award-winning graphics, and the graphics on the back of the box look like they're EGA, so possibly that supports it. Unfortunately, the disc is damaged, so I'm gonna have to try and find another copy that I don't have to pay for in order to try this one out. The ones in the middle here, the Amstrad Collection, Dan Busters, Bruce Lee, Sci-5 Trading Company, and Tag Team Wrestling, they are definitely all favourites of mine from back when I had a PC-1512 in my youth. 
Unfortunately, all four of these are CGI games. I've just realized though that Dam Busters is actually in this package. I have another one of these Amtrak PC collection packages and the Dam Busters disc was blank. So I'm really glad that I finally have this game. Now the other one is Operation Neptune and again it says IBM PC Amstrad and compatible so it does support the Amstrad but unfortunately the disc is a 720k disc not a 360k so I really can't play this one either on this machine. Well I thought I found a solution here. I found an EGA version of Defender of the Crown. I have a backup version of this but unfortunately it just doesn't run on this machine. When I run the defender.com file, nothing happens. It just goes back to the DOS prompt. What a shame. Well, let's try Ace of Aces. This is an EGA game and it's available in 1987, so the same year that this machine came out. It's an aircraft and dogfight simulator and yeah, it looks like it's gonna work. Beautifully illustrated here. This is an Accolade game. They made some really great games and they had great compatibility as well. Well, let's select a practice mission and I'll also go for Dogfight. And yeah, why haven't I seen this game before? It's got sound and everything. Uh, very, very well illustrated. I'm really impressed with the graphics here. Well, it's a pretty basic simulator. The clouds don't look very realistic and at least it's easy to figure out what to actually do in terms of controls with just space and the cursor keys. But you can see those clouds are not very realistic the way they're rendered there. I guess this is the trade-off that you had to make back in the day if you wanted to support early processors like the 8086 and already by 1987 that was certainly not the top dog in town. And yeah, I guess the performance here is actually okay, considering. Now, so far, I'm not particularly impressed with the playability of this game. It's just not very maneuverable with the keyboard. And even after five minutes, I've rarely been able to hit another aircraft. Most often what happens is the aircraft just moves out of the way or even just flies off while you're still trying to get lined up with it. And unfortunately, uh, the keyboard just doesn't respond uh, very well at all. It's probably better to play with a uh, joystick or something like that. It looks very pretty but unfortunately in terms of something that you'd be able to just pick up as a beginner even on a training mission as this is uh, I wouldn't rate this very highly at all. Now one other game I definitely want to show you before I go is Space Station Oblivion which is also EGA. You can see it's Epix 1988 and this used the Freescape engine which is significant because it does filled polygons and yeah, you can see that the rendering here is really quite impressive for the era. In fact, it was one of the earlier games to really do this convincingly. And hats off to the programmers that did this. I've tried this sort of thing myself and it really is quite difficult, especially on a machine of this vintage. Now, as for what you're supposed to do in this game, well, it's classed as a puzzle game and you're supposed to figure that out as you go. So one of the things you can do is plant drilling rigs and you just press the D key, it now says sector cleared, I can move back and I've got 54,000 points on my scoreboard, so I did something right. Every now and again you can see a few little graphical glitches, they don't get the polygons joining up exactly, uh, but it's still pretty amazing for the era. Uh, yeah, so I think I can probably put a drilling rig in this room as well, yep, I get more points for that. But uh, so far I haven't figured out many of the puzzles, unfortunately. I've just been going around admiring the graphics. There's like 18 different regions in this space station that you can visit, and I'm not going to spoil them all for you. Uh, but basically, if you go into a different place, you have to try and figure out what you're supposed to do there. You can see a few graphic glitches there as we're coming up to that door. Uh, so yeah, there's a door over there we could go into, but I'm going to go into this little storeroom here. Uh, inside here, there are little uh, shapes, they're tetrahedrons. If you run into them, they make a sound like you're doing something, but it doesn't collect them or anything, they're still there when you turn around. Uh, so I don't think that's what you're supposed to do here. Uh, if I try to plant a drilling rig in here, uh, it just says area neutral, so presumably you can't do that in here. Uh, so I haven't figured out that room just yet. Uh, but yeah, a really, really impressive game. 
Anyway, that's basically all I have time for this week. I've actually had a hectic weekend planning some stuff for the channel, uh, which we'll see in a later video. So I've been a bit engaged with other things. So just a short video this week, but I thought you'd really like to see this machine. Uh, I've been meaning to show it off for absolutely ages since I bought it. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed this little retrospective of the Amstrad PC 1640 and some of the games that were available around about the year that it was released. Anyway, that's it for this week. Uh, thanks very much for watching and we'll see you in a later video. Bye.